This is a cautionary tale about our food supply at risk. This is the mysterious disappearance of the seed. In the Second World War, while Nazi regiments besieged the Soviet city of Leningrad, a small team of scientists barricaded themselves into an underground vault and prepared to die. They had given themselves the task of guarding the Soviet Union's greatest national treasure. It wasn't a cache of golden icons or precious Fabergé eggs. No, these brave scientists had made a choice to protect the world's largest cache of seed. As the siege wore on for 900 days, in a cruel twist of irony, one by one, each man perished of starvation in the act of safekeeping their nation's food supply for future generations. A thousand miles away in a gulag prison, another brilliant scientist named Nikolai Vavilov also lay dying of starvation. His crime? Vavilov was the one who had cached and organized the vast collection of seeds by traveling around the world and studying different ecosystems. From his extensive conversations with traditional farmers and forest gardeners, Vavilov concluded that the preservation of diversity was the single most important factor in maintaining sustainable systems of food production. Vavilov's advice fell on the deaf ears of Joseph Stalin. Stalin wanted fast-growing uniform crops. He had his five-year plan, and he would only entertain what fit into the plan, never mind if it actually worked. Stalin had Vavilov imprisoned and listened instead to another scientist named Linesco, whose now debunked theories conveniently fit with Stalin's plan. During Stalin's regime, an estimated 30 million people died of starvation and malnutrition when the vast monoculture grain plantations he sanctioned failed year after year after year. So why have I just told you this big story from the pages of history? Well, because even more than teaching you how to save seed, which you can learn anywhere, to be honest, I want to give you the desire and the motivation to do it. As fellow gardeners here, I want you to know that I started small. I made mistakes, and I learned how to grow food through much trial and no little error. I encourage you to find your own rhythms and build your habits that work for your personality and your gardening goals. But saving seed, and more importantly, saving a diversity of seed, is a gardening must-do. Brave souls have died to protect seeds and many more people have perished for the lack of them. Learning how to save seed is the single most important skill you can learn as a gardener. It doesn't matter how many pounds of food you grow, how many hearts your garden pics get on Instagram, or how many butterflies flutter about your milkweed. If your garden exists only because of store-bought or ordered seed, it is simply not sustainable. What happens to your garden if an event disrupts the seed supply? Well, it's not just an idle conjecture. A disruption, a major disruption, of the commercial seed supply is exactly what happened last year when the world went into lockdown. My friend, urban gardener, Christina Mays, described the situation to me as it went down in the U.S. The consternation began in late May when seasoned greenskeepers couldn't find seeds. The unusually high demand meant every single online seed company sold out of springtime staples. Organic, heirloom, even run-of-the-mill vegetable seeds were gone from garden centers, grocery stores, hardware stores, and even dollar store shelves. Green thumbs raged red on social media when pollinator plants sold out next. A seasoned greenskeeper herself, Christina goes on to add why the sudden need for seeds didn't really bother her. The novice gardeners had my sympathy. Because I had seeds, lots of seeds. My seed stash wasn't a glut of online orders before the coronavirus reared its early crown. In fact, I didn't spend a cent on seeds in 2020. I didn't have to because I saved seeds from what I harvested last summertime. Christina isn't a botanist or an agronomist. She's just an avid home food grower who strives to cultivate a garden that is fruitful and resilient. A garden that can withstand disruptions. In this wildly unpredictable times, we absolutely need to focus on resilience. Because let's face it, it's during disruptions that you're going to need the food your garden produces the most. As a history buff, one thing that really got my attention in the quarantine-intensified gardening boom of 2020 
was the popular usage of the Victory Garden motif. It even became a hashtag all over social media, hashtag Victory Garden. If you're not familiar with the context, the Victory Garden became a popular call to arms when America entered World War II. With every factory and production facility in the country maxed out, making the instruments of war, food production and distribution patterns were widely disrupted for the cause. In a display of concerted patriotism and self-reliance, American people facing empty shelves at markets channeled their energy into home food production. Small, intensively cultivated gardens provided 40 to 50 percent of foods for personal consumption during the war years, 1941 to 45. People didn't only grow food, they canned, pickled, dried, and preserved it. But there's a big difference between the World War II Victory Gardens and the hashtag Victory Garden of 2020. In 1941, people had plenty of seeds to start their gardens. If there was social media at the time, I don't think we would see all the whining and bemoaning about seed shortages, because there wasn't a shortage. People had seeds. So why then, and why not now? Well, first of all, we're talking about a generation of people who had been inoculated to resilience by 12 years of the worst economic crisis Americans had ever known, the Great Depression. Even before the original Victory Garden movement took off, Small garden plots were common through the Depression era as a means to provide sustenance. Essentially, America was a nation of savers. When the Victory Garden became the must-have of every flag-waving citizen, anyone who didn't have seeds could ask their neighbor or the family down the street or the fellow with the small farm on the outskirts of town. Someone would have seeds and sell, share, or trade. In contrast, today, and I think we need to acknowledge this to move forward, America is pretty much a nation of throwaway consumers. Until right now, with the exception of a voodoo economics recession, a housing bubble here, and a dot-com crisis there, the American economy has been steamrolling along since the 1950s, fairly demolishing anything in its path. Seventy years of relative prosperity has had its sedating effect, lulling us into a false sense of security and submission. Hardly anyone saves anything except for some eccentrics and conspiracy theorists holed up in wilderness compounds, no one is ready for anything. It's like we're suddenly trying to follow the emergency exit procedure while the plane is at 30,000 feet. Even for people who do like to save odds and ends, seeds aren't a thing that gets saved because hardly anyone has a garden. The post-war boom of the 1950s also ushered in a whole new movement of millions of people out of the wonderland of suburban housing developments. The productive Victory Gardens, once the pride of the patriotic American, vanished into a green sea of ornamental, inedible grass known as the lawn. Even worse, now there are self-appointed overseers of lawns throughout American neighborhoods, a.k.a. the HOAs, who will only tell you that your fescue is perhaps too blue or your jasmine too Asiatic to have in your lawn, which is regimented to be green, inedible, and completely useless. As to the millions who caught the pandemic gardening fever last summer and proudly displayed their tomatoes and peppers on social media, very few appear to realize that saving seeds is an essential gardening skill. I did a quick search of popular online seed companies in the U.S. just now, and seeds for most garden staples are already waitlisted for next season. Clearly, we need to learn a lesson in seed saving and fast. So, I'm aware I'm getting close to sounding like a parent or a grandparent. You kids, let me tell you, you don't know how good you have it. So I do think it's critical to acknowledge our wastefulness and step up to do better, but I want to tone down the criticism and the tirade here with a little bit of compassion, because there's a whole nother piece to the puzzle of where did all the seeds go, and as we were driving on autopilot in the last 70 years of relative prosperity, uh, there were some things that happened that I think a lot of people are not aware of. So now I'm going to tell you about that story, the power grab. In other posts, I've talked about the effects of the Green Revolution, 
And so if you haven't read those, let me give you a little recap here on what the Green Revolution was. First of all, it's very misleadingly named. The only green thing about it was all the greenbacks that uh, got pocketed during that time. Started post-war in the 1950s, uh, basically with the large corporations that had created a lot of chemicals to use during the war. Things like napalm, Agent Orange. Um, and at that point, it was like, okay, what are we going to do with these chemicals? Oh, Agriculture. Yeah, let's do that. So the Green Revolution countered popular movements like the Victory Garden and just systematically dismissed traditional methods of growing food and distilled over thousands of years. In just a few short years, an army of scientists literally invented a whole new technology of food production based largely on theories and formulas abstracted from the realities of climate, seasonal changes, local growing conditions, and customs. These variable factors, according to the proponents of the Green Revolution, didn't matter, because science would now give humans the ability to control each and every factor. Scientists formulated herbicides to kill the weeds, pesticides to kill the insects attacking the crops now that the weeds were dead, fungicides to kill harmful, harmful spores now that the soil was dead, and finally, synthetic fertilizers to replace the nutrients in the dead soil destroyed by the previous rounds of chemicals. I don't want to imply that the Green Revolution replaced a folk art of food production with science. The traditional methods that were dismissed by those who stood to benefit from the Green Revolution, namely the pharmaceutical companies, weren't just the folk arts of un uneducated peasants. Their soil building techniques, intricately designed earthworks, terraces, still producing agroforestry systems. These were created by an allegedly unscientific people, but they speak to a profound degree of sophistication. The same degree of sophistication is evident in the methodologies traditional gardeners use to breed chosen plants over long periods of time to select for positive traits such as size and flavor. Traditional methods prove their worth over multiple generations of recorded observations and subtle adjustments. By appropriating science for itself, by taking plants out of the garden and putting them in the laboratory, the Green Revolution achieved its real goals, to co-opt the power of billions of ordinary people to feed themselves and concentrate it into the hands of a few vested and now immeasurably wealthy interests. Prior to the Green Revolution, Monsanto, Bayer, DuPont, Merck, Glaxo, they existed, but they were not the globally dominant companies that they are today. How did they get so powerful? They saw that seeds are wealth and set out to control the wealth. So this is getting very political. What does this have to do with you and your garden, perhaps you're thinking? Well, when I say these companies co-opted the power of billions of ordinary people, I'm talking about you and me. Ordinary people who can grow their own food are now somehow convinced that they need to buy seeds. For the long-term sustainable food production, the chemical inundation of the Green Revolution was bad. For preservation of local knowledge, the co-opting of power was worse. But where the Green Revolution has done its most irreparable damage is through the standardization of bioengineered so-called miracle seeds. The appropriation of the weird word miracle, quote-unquote, to describe engineered seeds that produce plants that cannot reproduce themselves is an extraordinary victory of propaganda. How can anyone see the logic in calling a seed that can't regenerate life a miracle? Well, the big pharma companies did it, big ags bought into the hoax, and now they can't get out. These so-called miracle seeds produce plants that produce sterile seeds, or seeds that produce inferior or not true to type plants. For the farmer and the gardener, they're dead ends. You have no choice but to buy more year after year. The other insidious move Big Pharma made, which is now being contested in multi-million dollar lawsuits, was to obtain patents, rights of intellectual property for their engineered seeds. Meaning that any farmer who doesn't buy seeds every year and saves seed to replant is in violation of the law. In addition to these rather alarming issues, let's not forget that since the Green Revolution began, the diversity of available seed has shrunk drastically. 
Here's a shocker of a number that I just dug up. Between 1903 and 1983, in these 80 years, 93% of variety in food seeds was lost. 93%. So if that seems impossible, let's just think about this. There's 40,000 plus plants on this planet that we can eat, edible species, wild and cultivated. Of those 40,000 or even more, only 200 are cultivated with any regularity. Of the, so we've gone from 40,000 down to 200. Now, of those 200, six, six, six people make up almost 70% of what we eat every day. And you know what they are, of course, wheat, corn, rice, soy, potatoes, right? So if anything happens to those crops, what happens to us? And what's even more frightening is of those very few crops, of those six, those six foods, there's very few varieties available because big ag and big pharma only want to maintain a few for their commodity value. So what happens to wheat production if the chosen few varieties fail or if blight strikes the few potato types produced for mass consumption? I think the Great Potato Famine in Ireland and the Stalin-era Soviet peasant famines already answered that question. People starve to death. The question that bears asking is why are we letting this happen again? Every day, seed by seed, our entire food supply is further concentrated into the grasping hands of very few people with one clear motive, wealth and power. Are these the people you want determining what, when, and if you and the rest of the world can eat? So maybe you're thinking, wow, I didn't know it was that bad. It's serious, but what can I do? I'm just one person. Well, actually, you can do something, and you and billions of other ordinary people can all do the most seditious thing of all, grow food and save seed. In fact, it's the smallness and inconspicuousness that you think renders you powerless that gives you power. Big Pharma can stick their packs of lawyers on large-scale farmers, but they cannot pursue every backyard, container, and rooftop gardener in the world. You have the ability to make a real difference. Even a very small garden will produce enough seeds to regenerate itself and start more the next year. In addition, you can help preserve the diversity of foods available to yourself, your children, and your community. With all these very serious issues facing us, be comforted because saving seed is also really fun. It's a great project to do with the kids. It's a conversation starter with folks in your neighborhood. And I speak from personal experience when I say that saving seed is excellent mind therapy in times of uncertainty. If you have seeds, natural seeds you saved from the plants you grew, you have the catalyst, you have the spark, you have the real miracle, the real deal right there in your hands. Simply sow, harvest, save seed, and repeat. Thank you. So if that reading inspired you to take action, which I certainly hope it did, and now you want more practical information on how to save seed, uh, I have written up a very thorough uh, post on that with step-by-step -step instructions, very bare bones, practical, gets right to the point, how to save seed, and I put that in the notes. There's also an excellent book I recommend called The Resilient Gardener by Carol Depp, a very funny and eccentric woman who lives out in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Great writer. It's a good read. And um, she's done a lot to actually bring back certain species from extinction by saving their seed. Here in Ecuador, Juan and I are doing the same. We've, uh, we cultivate Aroma Nacional Cacao, a very rare type, and we've saved seed and we've used that to cultivate about a thousand more plants. Um, so we're doing our, our part here as well. So thank you again for listening. Uh, this is all made possible by our supporters, our donors, people who buy our cacao, and most of all, our monthly supporters on Patreon. So please go over, take a look at our Patreon page. And to read more about everything we do here and see the rewards you also get when you sign up. Thank you so very much.